Hello and welcome to Pop Culture Graveyard. I am Hollis and this is our 50th episode. And when you turn 50, invariably, Steely Dan becomes your favorite band. It's science. So today we're going to pay tribute to one of the smartest quote-unquote bands ever. Steely Dan is more of a concept. Whatever, dude. And Steely Dan's body of work is so vast that this will be a two-parter episode. So this is part one of two. So please join me for this deep dive as I break down all their albums. Yeah, I know. Get comfortable. As I bring you the wit, wisdom, and wizardry of Steely Dan. Seriously, get comfortable. Let's hit it. Steely Dan, aka Walter Becker and Donald Fagan, and anyone they choose to play with, totally revitalized FM radio with their indefinable sound. A genre unto themselves, Steely Dan seamlessly blended rock, pop, jazz, R&B, Latin, and a whole lot of other musical forms into music that found success with both critics and public alike thanks to their stellar songcraft and masterful musicianship. Steely Dan are really indefinable, so let's just say that they created pop songs with really unique musical twists and turns. During my teen years, I used to think Steely Dan was old people music. I also thought it had nothing to do with actual rock and roll and was made in a science lab by robots. Once I hit my mid-twenties or so, I couldn't believe how wrong I had been. I mean, I was totally right about Steely Dan being grown folks music. However, their cynical, snarling lyrics which I had found so antiseptic and cold in my youth, now felt like slipping into a warm bath. A bath of acid, but still. By the way, if you ever refer to Steely Dan as the Dan in my presence, we can never be friends. I want you to know that going in. Early on, guitarist slash bassist Walter Becker and piano player slash vocalist Donald Fagan were finding it very hard to get any takers for their original music. They bided their time as backup musicians for Jay Black and the Americans, and later as staff writers for ABC Records. One project that did fall into their laps was working on the soundtrack to a small, independent 1971 film called You Gotta Walk It Like You Talk It or You'll Lose That Beat. Yes, that is the actual title. Known mostly today for Becker and Fagan's involvement, as well as being an early Richard Pryor film appearance, the boys found themselves regretting taking the job. But there are spots on this album where their future magic shines through. Dog Eat Dog, Roll Back the Meaning, and If It Rains were just a few songs where the boys weren't hemmed in by lyrics given to them by the writer-producer Peter Locke, and it shows. Their old pal guitarist Denny Diaz also worked with them on this. Yeah, I know, I thought it was Diaz too, but Becker and Fagan call him Diaz, so I call him Diaz. Incidentally, this is the 1978 edition of the soundtrack. The original 1971 cover has the movie's cartoon poster. I'm going to put the link below to the soundtrack because it's a fascinating listen to some early Becker Fagan songs. In 1972, the first official release by Steely Dan was a single for the song Dallas with a B-side Sail the Waterway, sung by drummer slash singer Jim Hodder and featuring some beautiful pedal steel guitar by Jeff Skunk Baxter. Dallas is a great underknown Steely Dan track. Their record contract required them to release a single prior to their debut album, so Dallas was chosen. But when the song failed to get radio airplay, ABC Records said that the song wasn't representative of the Steely Dan sound and quietly pulled the album from the marketplace. The B-side Sail the Waterway doubled down on Dallas's country-tinged sound, and both tracks are well worth hearing, so I'll put the links below. In October of 1972, the band released Can't Buy a Thrill. It is crazy in retrospect to think that this is anyone's debut album especially when most bands would be thrilled to have a greatest hits album with these songs on them. The skilled songcraft and steady musicianship of this album is staggering, especially when you consider that at the time of its release, its songwriters Donald Fagan and Walter Becker were 24 and 22 years old, respectively. Open or Do It Again is an irresistible track that was one of the most incongruous hits on the radio. It was too long, it's in a minor key, it's not cheery. Those are all things station programmers hate, but it tells a story, 
It has an irresistible beat, and its sexy yet insidious instrumental lead-in hooked listeners immediately. It features a stellar electric sitar solo from Denny Diaz. Incidentally, the fact that Do It Again was the first and last time that Denny Diaz ever played an electric sitar should tell you that Denny is a badass. Featuring murder, lynch mobs, and card sharps, Do It Again is a sonic spaghetti western with some of the most cinematic songwriting ever written. Do It Again was the first single from the album. The band allowed a few minutes to be trimmed out of Do It Again, and the song became an unlikely hit, reaching number six on the charts. Dirty Work is a gorgeous sounding song about a man who is tired of being the other man who a married woman calls every time her husband is out of town. This song is sung by David Palmer, who is in the band for this album only. If I'm Palmer, I'm fine with this song being my musical legacy. He does an outstanding job on lead vocals. It's plaintively sung with just the right mixture of fragility and strength in his voice. By the end of the song, we're not sure if he'll stay or go. Come on. He's not going anywhere. But Palmer absolutely nails this vocal, and it's his finest recorded moment with Steely Dan. Incidentally, for those of you that don't know, David Palmer was brought in as lead vocalist because Donald Fagan, with one of the best voices ever, hated the sound of his voice. He did not feel it was worthy of being lead vocal. So they beat the bushes for lead vocalists, and they settled upon David Palmer, who did like four songs, maybe, in their early repertoire. This is why Donald Fagan shares vocal duties on this album with David Palmer and Jim Hodder. I love Dirty Work, and it's one of my favorite songs on this album. You know who else loves Dirty Work? The late, great Tony Soprano. Those are two glowing endorsements. Check it out. Becker and Fagan have called the next song Kings, a vacuous historical romance set in the 12th century. But it's up to you if they were simply being evasive. Does King Richard stand in for Nixon? Do the Crusades stand in for the Vietnam War? Is Gerald Ford King John? I don't know these things. Becker and Fagan admit to nothing. What I do know is that Elliot Randall plays a scorching guitar solo that disappears almost as immediately as it appears. Elliot was given freedom to fully improvise the solo, and its mixture of the melodic and the offbeat is a thrilling tightrope walk. Midnight Cruiser is sung by the band's drummer, Jim Hodder, who had a very unique voice, and thanks to Fagan's insecurity, he got this song all to himself. I'm not sure why Becker and Fagan disguised Thelonious Monk's first name as Felonious in the lyrics. Perhaps they weren't comfortable putting Monk's madness on blast. But Midnight Cruiser is a beautiful tribute to the clubs, faces, and era that by the time of this album's release were long gone in the NYC jazz scene. The chorus is one of their best, and it's pretty enough to appeal to even the most casual Steely Dan fan. The song Only a Fool Would Say That sounds very upbeat for Steely Dan, and it ended up as the B-side to their next single, which I'll get to in a minute. I've always loved the spots in this song that Fagan chose to hit the high notes on, such as on the end of the lines, unhand that gun, be gone, and you do his nine to five. It shows wonderful range to his usual downbeat voice. When this great song finally collapses, we're left with Skunk Baxter speaking Spanish that sounds a lot more like gibberish. Side two, track one, the power slot, rightfully goes to Reelin' in the Years, as irresistible of a pop song as ever there was. Reelin' in the Years was the second single from this album, and it just narrowly missed being in the top ten. I see the song as being an angry rebuke against a woman who chose another man over the song's narrator, and he is not happy. After several unsuccessful attempts by Skunk Baxter to play a suitable solo, Skunk suggested Elliot Randall give it a try. Elliot, who had only been invited down by Skunk to say hi to the guys, went into the booth and nailed an impossibly perfect solo in just two takes. None other than Jimmy Page once said that it was his favorite guitar solo of all time. So, you know, not bad. Quick story about just how big this song was when I was little. I remember Donnie and Marie, unironically, covering this song on their variety show. I didn't know much, but I knew it just didn't sound right. I didn't have the vocabulary yet to call it a crime against humanity. But I was already savvy enough to know it shouldn't be happening. In my adulthood, I tried to convince myself that it was nothing more than a fever dream brought on by a mixture of Robitussin and Devil Dogs, but I can now say it happened. I tracked down the offending TV footage, and I'm going to put it below for your, um, I was going to say benefit, but let's just say curiosity. Reeling in the Years is your first clue that Side B 
isn't going to let up one bit. Chosen by the band for the B-side of the Do It Again single, Fire in the Hole is a weary dirge built around a radiant piano solo as its centerpiece. I believe the song is about someone in a dead-end job. I picture a waiter working for a low-grade catering company who knows that they're cut out for better things, but doesn't know what. It's a song of simmering frustration that threatens to boil over into an explosion. Hence the phrase, fire in the hole, which was uttered by soldiers when tossing a grenade. This is, of course, only my opinion. The beautiful thing about all of Steely Dan's lyrics are that they are open for interpretation. Almost maddeningly so. But I believe it's the oblique nature of their lyrics that keeps their songs from aging badly like so many of their 70s peers. Late in the song, when the guitar gets its chance to shine, it gives us some welcome variety that rides us all the way to the fade out. Brooklyn sees our old pal David Palmer back for some more tight-pants warbling, and he does a very good job. On the page, the song technically doesn't have a chorus, but all the verses end with the same line tacked onto it, so I guess that's the chorus. The song concerns a guy who is cryptically referred to in the album liner notes only as President Street Pete, who lived in the apartment underneath Fagan in Brooklyn. The song is simply a list of all the things that President Street Pete and his wife have coming to them as payback for the indignities of a life spent suffering in Brooklyn. Change of the Guard is uplifting as hell. And uplifting is not a word that you hear much to describe Steely Dan or their music. The lyrics are clever, the backing vocals are gorgeous, but to be honest, Skunk Baxter's fiery guitar solo about midway through walks off with the whole damn song, and it slides from speaker to speaker thanks to a really deft production touch. Turn That Heartbeat is an awesome album closer. The song has an amazing opening line, with stocking face, I bought a gun. That's one way to get a deal. And its chorus features Becker, Fagan, and Palmer all blending their voices together in unison. And it's beautiful. For all the crap David Palmer had to take in the years after Steely Dan, he really had a lovely voice. And when he hits that last high note on the word turn towards the end of the song, dear God, what a voice. This album, like every Steely Dan album, was produced by Gary Katz. Gary really knew how to work with Donald and Walter, and he did an outstanding job on all their albums. This is a beautiful album that deserved all the critical acclaim it got and I highly recommend it to anyone. In July of 1973, the band released Countdown to Ecstasy. No sophomore slump here, quality-wise, not commercially. I love the opening statement the band make on this album with Bodhisattva, a rare song at the time in that Donald Fagan wrote the whole song without any input from Walter Becker. The song's brilliant lyrics about how Westerners view Eastern religion brings great humor to the song, featuring languid guitar lines hectic piano cording, and a confident vocal from Fagan. Bodhisattva is an irresistible, overwhelming track whose sound creates the illusion of a really cooking live band. Denny Diaz outdoes himself with a gorgeous guitar solo, helping to make Bodhisattva the quickest 5 minutes and 18 seconds of your life. I especially love the lyrics, the shine in your Japan, the sparkle in your China. Peerless lyrics. Punk rock fans, let's play a little game. I say the Bad Brains use the final ending to Bodhisattva for the end of one of their songs. You tell me which it is. Razor Boy is a peaceful, placid respite after the adrenaline rush of Bodhisattva, but its lyrics are anything but restful. So just who is this song's titular Razor Boy who comes to take all your fancy things away? He could be an abusive husband who keeps his wife in a metaphorical cage or an actual criminal who takes away everything you have. I like to think that Razor Boy is cocaine itself. You know how you cut up cocaine with a razor? Which comes for a guy after he's in with the better half, living by night and frequenting establishments where women actually dance in cages. And it's his ensuing addiction that takes away every damn thing he's got. It features breathtaking work on the vibes and marimba by Victor Feldman, a guy who played with everyone from Cannonball Adderley to Gordon Lightfoot. The next song, The Boston Rag, is a fugue. The song alludes to Lonnie Young, who is a friend of Fagan's. Lonnie was a very popular guy, or a kingpin, back at Bard College, who once went on a two-day drug bender and came back alive. The gymnastic guitar solo was played by Jeff Baxter, who had originally suggested to Fagan that he uses a chord change that Skunk liked from Bach's Toccata and Fugue. Skunk was amazed to see Fagan use it immediately and perfectly in the Boston Rag. The next track, Your Gold Teeth, I believe is about a woman who uses her feminine wiles to ensnare men, but her game isn't good enough to fool the song's narrator. 
that weak ass game won't play in Chicago. Fagan's keyboard work on your gold teeth is flawless. Do I hear a Wurlitzer in there? And truly shows you how wrong he was about always downplaying his performing chops. Speaking of chops, Danny Diaz lays down some masterful guitar work. And in fact, the entire band helped to arrange this song. It was actually one of the last chances the band would have to give their input on songs. Side 2 kicks off with Showbiz Kids, featuring some raunchy slide guitar from Rick, rock and roll hoochie coo Derringer. The backing vocalists repetitively sing the refrain, You go to Lost Wages, Lost Wages, which is a dad joke quality name that Lenny Bruce came up with for Las Vegas. Ironically, the lyrics to Showbiz Kids show you just how much Becker and Fagan refuse to play the showbiz game. The boys drop a low-key F-bomb into the lines. Showbiz kids making movies of themselves, you know they don't give a fuck about anybody else. My Old School makes mention of a pot bust at which Fagan and Becker were both arrested back at Bard College. The young district attorney who orchestrated that pot bust? G. Gordon Liddy, a.k.a. Daddy G. My Old School has some of the most beautiful vocal performances on this album. Speaking of beautiful, Pearl of the Quarter might just be the most beautiful song on this album. Becker and Fagan often mix the gorgeous with the gritty, and this song is no different. It is a sweet-sounding song about a guy who falls in love with a hooker, and it features more great pedal steel guitar from Skunk Baxter. Riding a hyperactive bass line and a sinister synth, King of the World has some real uncut funk under its fingernails. I must admit though, the track's balls to the wall synth solo always reminds me of the theme song to my beloved In Search Of with Leonard Nimoy. You listen for yourself and let me know. Of course, this is all based on conjecture. In 1974, the band released Pretzel Logic. This album features the first tentative steps into a workshop situation for Becker and Fagan, the rotating session musicians technique that they would fall more and more in love with on subsequent albums. Ricky Don't Lose That Number is a very simple love song to a young lady from the perspective of an older gent in a resort who captured her heart. The opening bass line is very reminiscent of Horace Silver's Song For My Father. If you listen to the openings of both songs back to back, it is uncanny. However, according to Fagan, that was not the intent. They'd written a Brazilian style bass line, but when studio whiz Jim Gordon saw the chart, he just naturally started playing that kind of beat and the bass just took it from there. Fagan and Becker are big jazz heads and no doubt enjoyed the fact that it was so similar, but it is a fairly generic bass line and I doubt it's the kind of thing that anyone can copyright. In Ricky Don't Lose That Number, we go back again to Bard. Fagan supposedly had a crush on a faculty wife named Ricky. He will not admit this, but it's fairly well known. Nothing happened. It was an unrequited crush, but he immortalized her name in song. It is far from the only great song on this album. The song Night by Night was Steely Dan's attempt to be commercial but their idea of commercial and the record company's idea of commercial were never really in sync, and Night by Night was not considered for a single. As in many Steely Dan songs, the lyrics are vague enough to support many interpretations. If I were to hazard a guess, I'd say this song concerns a man on the margins of society who, equally in danger from the law and the criminal element, decides to take it on the lam. The real story here is the blistering guitar solo by Skunk Baxter who outdoes himself again, as he does many times on this album. Skunk's solo serves the song perfectly, and from the solo on, the guitar maintains a strong presence and drives the song to its fade-out conclusion. Session drumming god Jim Gordon drummed on all of the tracks for Pretzel Logic, except for Night by Night. The drums on Night by Night were handled by 18-year-old Jeff Porcaro, and the band loved the job he did, and he would play on lots of future Steely Dan albums. Any Major Dude Will Tell You gives you your third great song in a row, and it features the wonderfully idiosyncratic line, Have you ever seen a squonk's tears? A squonk is a mythical animal whose defense mechanism is the ability to cry until it completely dissolves into tears. Any Major Dude is seriously easy on the ears, features another stellar guitar solo from Skunk, and is possibly one of their most underrated songs. When the demon is at your door, in the morning it won't be there no more. Sleep tight, kids. The horribly titled Barrytown is all about a small village not far from Bard College. Steely Dan's alma mater, yet again. A song solely written by Donald Fagan, 
Barrytown features perhaps my least favorite Steely Dan chorus, but I love the verses. I believe it speaks to how people who come from that kind of intellectual, free-thinking area have a special lack of grace that is praised by the narrator. But he's warning the Barrytown resident that others he will meet in the future, aka the normals, won't exactly be glad to see him. It's not that hard to see this song as a chronicling of the icy welcome that Becker and Fagan got from other musicians and the record industry itself once they came out of college. The music to Barrytown is fantastic, and the vocals on the bridge are some of the prettiest on any Steely Dan song. The song East St. Louis Toodaloo is unique in that it's the only cover song on any Steely Dan album. An electronic updating of a Duke Ellington song originally recorded in 1929, Becker and Fagan took three different recordings Duke made of the song and combined their best parts into one version. Steely Dan's updating of this theme song for Duke Ellington and his Washingtonians saw Fagan's piano in place of clarinet and Becker's wah-wah guitar in place of trumpet. Incidentally, this song also marks the first time that Walter Becker ever plays six-string guitar on a Steely Dan album. Mr. Parker's band is a rambunctious tribute to brilliant sax superstar Charlie Parker. I love the bridge, which is almost psychedelic sounding, and I love the masterful allusion to both Charlie's old bandmate Dizzy Gillespie and Mr. Parker's heroin addiction in the line, we will spend a dizzy weekend smacked into a trance. As succinct as an obituary and as florid as an autobiography, Mr. Parker's band may be the most beautiful tribute to and celebration of Charlie Parker that has ever been written. Through With Buzz is another unique track in that it has the distinction of being Steely Dan's shortest song at a minute and a half. Lots of Steely Dan fans feel it's their worst song, citing its use of strings and its repetitious quality. But those are two of the reasons I like it. Marrying a paranoid lyric to a sweet melody, they do that a lot. Through With Buzz chronicles a platonic couple where one friend realizes he's being used and breaks off the relationship. More a song fragment than a fully fledged song, I don't think it would have taken much for them to turn Through With Buzz into a classic. Title track, Pretzel Logic, is some of the smoothest music the band had yet recorded. Laid back, yet with a sinister undertone. The song tells the story, if Donald Fagan is to be believed, of a time traveler who plans on going back in time to visit all those special moments and characters in history, like Napoleon, who have so enamored the song's narrator in movies and TV. The song With a Gun is just plain fun, and it gives a bird's eye view of one possible alternate universe where instead of Steely Dan, Becker and Fagan had formed The Eagles. The song is a rollicking pastiche of Wild West imagery, which finds a man ambushed by his partner. Featuring a beautiful melody, the song positively gallops, and I absolutely love the backing vocals. Charlie Freak is a very old song, one of the first that Becker and Fagan wrote when they were starting out. The production on the song always sounds to me very much like a Christmas song. I can swear I hear sleigh bells. I also think I hear a backwards violin on this track, which lends a futuristic touch. I believe it tells the story of a man who buys a gold ring from a homeless man, and he practically robbed this guy because it's such an uneven deal. And when he finds out that the man later died, he rushes to the morgue to see him. The song raises more questions than answers, and that's one of the reasons I love Charlie Freak. Monkey in Your Soul was one of the later songs to be recorded for the album, and it finishes the album off. Featuring some very funky sax, the song seems to detail a musician who has to leave their partner for fear that one's addiction will drag them both down. I'm embarrassed to admit that it took me many years to realize that the song I had been singing, I Feel the Monkey in Your Soul, was actually I Fear the Monkey in Your Soul. Much better line and a very different vibe. Mine was more carefree. This album broke things wide for Steely Dan and was a massive success. In March of 1975, the band released Katie Lied. This whole album is meant to present each song from a different perspective, which adds up to a whole story told by a narrator suffering from depression. You know, usual pop song stuff. The cover of the album shows a picture of a Katie did. Bush Cricket, if you're nasty, is from a photo taken by Donald Fagan's girlfriend at the time, Dorothy White, and Donald Fagan thought that it would be a very fitting picture and the back album design was based on the one used by jazz label Contemporary Records. This album features Michael McDonald on backing vocals, and his presence adds some really lovely texture to the songs. 
And the line Katie lied is a paraphrasing of a lyric that's in one of the songs, and it existed before the picture. Black Friday is a really jaunty way to open this album. The song's narrator is letting us know that when Black Friday comes, he'll have already made his escape with enough money to live contentedly in Australia, far from the cares of his current world. I believe the narrator is referring to a proverbial Black Friday sometime in the future, while the song references a previous Black Friday in which the stock market crash sent men in gray flannel suits plummeting to their deaths. Bad Sneakers features an endearingly vulnerable vocal from Donald, singing about just how much he misses New York. Becker and Fagan did not enjoy living in Los Angeles. I must admit, once Michael McDonald's backing vocals kick in, his distinctive voice overpowers the song, and Bad Sneakers suddenly sounds like a Doobie Brothers track. But that wasn't evident at the time because he wasn't with the Doobie Brothers yet. So this sound was fresh. But you're gonna hear what I mean, and it's one of Steely Dan's prettiest sounding choruses. The music for Rose Darling seems to be another Donald Fagan written fugue, to which he adds a counterpoint in the vocal melody. My best guess is that this song is about masturbation. At night, when this guy's partner, referred to as Snake Mary, falls asleep, dreaming of a richer life in another town, he's finally free to visit Rose and wear the weary hours down. Sly lines such as, you won't feel it till it grows, and the clock is close at hand are further clues to my self-flagellation theory. Daddy Don't Live in That New York City No More is a rather straightforward song about an alcoholic criminal, a pimp, a mafia goon, a drug dealer, you decide, who dies in a car crash, and now his lady, his El Dorado, and his liquor store all have to do without him. Guitar god Larry Carlton lays the smack down with some beautifully melodic guitar lines, and it's one of Fagan's most inspired vocal performances. A line in the next song, Dr. Wu, is how we arrived at the title of this album. The beginning of the line, Katie Lies, you can see it in her eyes, was paraphrased to create Katie Lied. The Dr. Wu mentioned in the song takes its name directly from an acupuncturist who was treating a member of the band for his drug addiction. I will not mention names, but in the song, Dr. Wu could be the drug itself. I'm guessing opium. It could be addiction, but it's clear that something nefarious is going on. The chorus to Dr. Wu is one of their best, beautiful and weird at the same time, which kind of sums up Steely Dan. Everyone's Gone to the Movies pairs pretty music with prurient lyrics, which is a very familiar trick for Becker and Fagan. The song's Mr. Lepage is not a good man. He's showing dirty movies to young teens. The lines, we know you're used to 16 or more, sorry we only have eight, is Mr. Lepage explaining that he doesn't have anything of higher quality than the 8mm films he's playing. Mr. Lepage is also trying to mack on the young ladies. Not a good guy. Subject matter aside, the song is absolutely gorgeous. And you all know I'm a sucker for a vibraphone. Your Gold Teeth 2 has a style that is pure bebop and is a reprise of the earlier Your Gold Teeth off Countdown to Ecstasy. Chain Lightning almost reminds me of the Manhattan Transfer. It has such gorgeous layered harmonies. This was one of their most enigmatic songs for years, until during an interview Fagan let it slip that it's about two guys attending a fascist rally. Then 40 years later, the pair go back to where the little man, let's give him a name, I don't know, Adolf, once stood. It's some of their most clever lyric writing. Any world that I'm welcome to is an older, Fagan and Becker composition that they originally intended for a female lead singer, like Dusty Springfield, but now Donald is on lead vocals, and it's perfect for him. The way that they strip away the beautiful part of the backing vocalists and just leave Fagan's voice bare at the end of the chorus works like a charm. Any World That I'm Welcome To is a great song. The album ends on Throwback the Little Ones. This idiosyncratic song, more than any other song on this album, reminds me the most of early Becker and Fagan compositions. It's a slight song, but it has some outstanding guitar from Larry Carlton, and his great work throughout this album would begin a relationship that would stretch far. That's it for this week. Join me next week for the second installment of Steely Dan, A Deep Dive. If you're enjoying the bands I'm bringing you, and if you'd like to support the channel, please consider joining my Patreon. It's at patreon.com forward slash popculturegraveyard, and I appreciate you helping me to grow this channel.